The Institute for Smiley Studies has written an article called The Aga Khan Development Network, an Ethical Framework. And I thought I would do a few videos that kind of describe this article and maybe summarize some of its more uh, salient points. So let me dive right in and, and read from the introduction of the article. It says, quote, The Aga Khan Development Network is a contemporary endeavor of the Ismaili Imamat to realize the social conscience of Islam through institutional action. It brings together, under one coherent aegis, institutions and programs whose combined mandate is to help relieve society of ignorance, disease, and deprivation without regard to the faiths or national origins of people whom they serve. In societies where Muslims have a significant presence, its mandate extends to efforts to revitalize and broaden the understanding of cultural heritage in the full richness of its diversity, as the quality of life in its fullest sense extends beyond physical well-being. The primary areas of concern are the poorest regions of Asia and Africa. The institutions of the network derive their impetus from the ethics of Islam, which bridge the two realms of the faith Din and Dunya, the spiritual and the material. The central emphasis of Islam's ethical ideal is enablement of each person to live up to his exalted status as a physicerant of God on earth, in whom God has breathed his own spirit and to whom he has made whatever is in the heavens and the earth an object of trust and quest. It's a very powerful phrase, and I think there's just quite a lot of... Um, content kind of packed in this one introduction, but let me try to dissect a little bit of it. So um, the, the terms din and dunya are, are mentioned, and din basically represents the spiritual. Um, so it represents the spiritual aspect of our lives, okay? And dunya, dunya represents the complement, that represents the, the material, the material aspects of our lives. And, and, you know, I do want to emphasize here that um, you know, when you think about dunya, even though it's, we talk about it being the material, um, the term shouldn't necessarily be thought of in the pejorative sense. I mean, the reality is that dunya can be thought of as a gift, a bridge to the life um, hereafter. And at the same time, I think there is a dichotomy in that it's very easy for a person to become distracted from his true purpose of life, which is service to God, by becoming attached to the material. And so, really, in many ways, um, you know, what Islam espouses is, is the notion that uh, din and dunya are not, uh, you know, even though they're maybe separate concepts, they are, in fact, fundamentally tied together in a highly inextricable way. Um, you know, din represents, obviously, the, the spiritual aspects, you know, really a person's willingness to submit to his Lord. Um, and life is about effectively balancing between these two. It's effectively about balancing between Din and dunya, and there's a quote in the paper that says, quote, Righteousness, says the Quran, is not only fulfilling one's religious obligations. Without social responsibility, religiosity is a show of conceit. Islam is, therefore, both din and dunya, spirit and matter, distinct but linked, neither to be forsaken. And I think the key words, I mean, there's many, many key words here, but obviously social responsibility and the idea that it's not just enough to kind of be religious in and of itself or in a vacuum, because that could be a show of conceit, but in reality, you have to be, you have to take those, those maybe religious values and use them to help better society. In other words, live within the ethic of the faith. Now, I think while personal morality is certainly important, in, you know, in Islam, um, there is an expectation that individuals will engage in morally just conduct towards others, not just for their own betterment, but for the betterment of, of the broader society. And in this case, ethics ethics becomes a real kind of means to that, to, to enable that. And in particular, it becomes a means by which self-realization can be precipitated through altruism, quote, for the, the common good in response to God's benevolent majesty, unquote. Now, because Islam basically connects these societal values with God, it adds really a spiritual dimension to the concept of public and social order. Now, kind of maybe taking a step back and thinking about the, the history of Islam and the way that it developed, 
um, over time, um, you know, Muslims today emulate the the behavior of and the conduct of uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, the founder of the religion, may peace be upon him. Okay, and they kind of look to the Prophet's example for how to act, and, and in particular, um, you know, really with, with regard to how the Prophet kind of suffused his daily life with a sense of the spiritual. I mean, the Prophet, everything he did was, was kind of melding the spiritual with his day-to-day -day actions. Now, within Islam, uh, there is a, a branch of Islam known as Shia Islam, and the other major branch is Sunni Islam. But in Shia Islam, um, there is a notion um, of the imamat, okay, the imamat, and the imamat, um, I, I should clarify, the term imam here does not mean uh, what it might mean maybe in, in the popular sense of the word, like for example, the imam of a mosque or something, but within the concept of Shia Islam, uh, the notion of imamat has a, has a very specific uh, definition, it really refers to a chain of individuals who have directly descended from the Prophet, uh, in other words, the Prophet is, is their direct ancestor, through a blood lineage, and the Imams are specific individuals who have been conferred with the Prophet's authority after his death. And so the idea was that the, the Imamat was, uh, the Shias believed that the Imamat um, really helped uh, to maintain a sense of authority after the Prophet passed away and to kind of help um, promote the community and promote its well being. All right. Now, you know, within the, the Shia context, it's really incumbent upon the Imams to kind of continue the Prophet's example of suffusing daily life or, or dunya with the spiritual or din. In other words, you know, they, they really believe that this, this concept, this interplay between din and dunya had to be um, promoted. And in the Prophets and the Imams, it was incumbent on them to kind of promote or to continue promoting that notion of the interplay between din and dunya. All right, and the imams today really do that through social and institutional orders. Now, I think that helps us kind of set the groundwork for, for talking about what the Aga Khan Development Network, or AKDN, um, you know, kind of what, what its underpinnings are from an ethical standpoint. But really, the AKDN's goal is to, quote, realize the social vision of Islam, unquote. And the, the means and aims are in many ways quite practical. For example, things like relief to humanity or the upliftment of human dignity. Uh, mandates that maybe transcend uh, boundaries of creed, color, race, and nationality, uh, the empowerment of the individual, uh, engendering self-reliance, embracing philanthropy, the sharing of time and talent, enabling uh, the transparency and accountability of government, engendering brotherhood, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Now, even though these are kind of practical aims or, or, or aims that are maybe rooted in, in, in kind of day-to-day -day life, their underlying motivations, the, the kind of underpinnings of those aims are spiritual. They're, they're driven by din. Okay, and it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, and so the next big question that crops up is, you know, what are the exact um, ethical traits within Islam that are really behind the AKDN's mandates? And I'll tackle that question in the next video.